So the best thing to do is just sort of mess around and keep playing with it. My grandmother said, there are no rules. Just play with it, have fun with it, watch what it does, and you're going to learn. And this is really true. That said, here are a bunch of tricks that you can put into your quiver of nature journaling tools uh, for playing with watercolor. And um, if you um, if you have prepared a bunch of materials, and the list of all the materials is on my website, johnmirlaws.com, um, then you are ready to follow along with us. Um, otherwise, you might find yourself running all over the house um, or can try these on your own later. Are you ready? Let's go. Um, all right, we are going to jump over to, oh, uh, we're, yeah, we're gonna jump over to the document camera. And here we go. Let me turn, oh, no, not that way, whoa. There we are. So you see, we've got, we've got quite an agenda here today. And um, we are going to, it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and I am not going to kind of go in this order, but these will end up in a neat order when I'm all done. I am going to start with ones that just sort of take a little bit longer to, to, to do um, for them. They have to kind of, things have to dry in a certain way. And so to make that happen, um, I'm going to be kind of jumping around on this chart. And um, so I'm not going to be necessarily starting with the ones that are the most important. I'm not going to be starting with the ones that are the most sort of high percentage techniques. I'm going to be starting with the ones that sort of often need the most time to dry. And so one thing I'm going to do is start here. I'm going to start here by playing with a little bit of masking fluid. And um, masking fluid is a... It's a kind of like a rubber cement that you put down onto your piece of paper and then you can paint over it. This kind comes in a convenient little pen, but a lot of us are starting to find out and actually from my um, my, my, my testing on this, um, this one, um, the, the type that I have, oh, come on, here we go. This... This is the problem I was having. This is, it comes in a convenient pen, which is convenient until it's not working. Um, so what I'm going to do is mess with it a little bit. I've just pulled it apart. I'm going to take a, a little stylus, stick it down the throat of it, put its little cap back in, and hope that uh, there it gets a little bit more of, of a flow. And what this is is still not really working for me. Good news was, it, well, it was working 10 minutes ago. Hmm. Well, an inauspicious start to our workshop. Um, Jack, sometimes they come with a, a second nib on there. Did, did you use the second nib already? Yep, I've already used my second nib. Um, okay. But the nib on this one and is just, it's all just sort of a solid plastic thing. Um, and so that, uh, now it's flowing a little bit better. It just needed to, um, it needed to get scared of, of being put aside and, and made fun of. Um, no, it's, it's still, it's not cooperating very much. Um, so these come in, in two uh, different styles. One is you can get them in a pen that, as you see here, um, sometimes doesn't um, do what you want it to do. Um, the other thing we're finding with this, uh, with this pen type is that um, sometimes you put it down and it doesn't want to come back off. Um, and that often depends on how long it's been sitting there, the type of paper that you're using. Um, other types you can buy in a little jar and you put them on with a brush. They will absolutely destroy the brush that you have. So use kind of junky brushes and um, that will um, that will make you, 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 you happier because then 
um, you're, you don't you don't trash your favorite brushes. Um, but the, uh, the the big idea is you put this stuff down. This stuff has a little bit of green color in it, so you can see where you put it down. And then that dries, and you can paint over it, and we'll see what happens with that in just a moment. So while this is drying, I'm going to jump over to another one that also is going to require a bit of time. So <clears throat> off to a little bit of an inauspicious start, but we'll see where we go from here. Let's play with salt. This was actually the, uh, we got a special request of, uh, you know, show us how we can use salt in watercolor. Um, this salt gives you really interesting, crystally, starry, sparkly effects. Um, the and it looks. Um, I've seen it used in some people's paintings where they kind of have it be sort of spray around a wave um, or stars in a sky or snowflakes coming down. The only problem with that is it doesn't look <clears throat> like spray on a wave. It doesn't look like stars sparkling in the sky. Um, it kind of looks like when you um, get it down on your paper, it looks like you have salt on watercolor. Um, it doesn't look like snowflakes, but I've often seen it kind of put into a snow scene as sort of the, you know, here's how you make snowflakes, put the salt down, um, and you will get cool effects. You will get some really cool effects. Um, only problem is it doesn't look like like snowflakes, but it's it's really cool. So if you're ever kind of wanting kind of a neat background effect, so I've just put some um, paint down here. I'm getting some salt in my hand, and I'm going to sprinkle some salt over this, and we will see what starts to happen there over time. So there is some salt on that page. So we'll be coming back to that by the end of this workshop. There will be something interesting happening here in the, in the salt. Um, now, let's play with, um, ah, um, I am going to, um, I'm going to do a little experiment down here, um, with some paint that I'm going to let dry. And so what I'm going to do over here is I'm just going to put down an area of paint and Matt, can you push your page up just a little bit? Oh, sure. Uh, or move this little guy. There we go. All right. I'm putting some paint here. I'm going to be letting this dry. And I'll be doing something fun with this after it's dry. Here we are. And uh, while I'm waiting for this to dry, um, I'm going to kind of go along my bottom row here, and we are going to do, we're going to play with lifting out some paint. Some paint, there's a couple of different types of, 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 of paint that you can get, that when you buy paint, different types of paint either sit on the surface of the paper, or they soak in and they stain the paper. If your paint sits on the surface, you can do this really cool thing called lifting out. And it allows you to get some really fun effects. So I'm going to take some, let's say it's a beautiful, a beautiful day, and I want some clouds in my sky. Here I am putting some paint down. And what I'm going to do is just take a piece of 
facial tissue here. And I am going to tap onto the page. And you notice when I do that, paint is off of here and onto here. So as I come along here, I get some really fun, very soft edged cloud shapes. If I press hard with my finger, I can make the edges. So if I, if I go lightly, I get these very sort of soft edge things. But if I come in here and I want a bit of a harder edge, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to press a little bit more forcefully. And I have just sort of lifted out a little form there. I can also take it and spin it into a little, little screw here and wipe with it and make a little line. So that is lifting out with a once it's dry, you know, I get in here, I can't lift out anymore. If I want to lift out more in here, if I were to get in there and re-wet this, so a little part in there, and I let it sit there for a while, so let that sort of paint that had dried just kind of soak in my puddle a little bit and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. Ah, let's give it a try now. I'm going to get back in there, press hard again. I can lift out a little bit more of that, but not very much. All right. So that is lifting out with a piece of facial tissue. All right. I can also lift out with a paper towel. Um, this isn't quite as soft. It's a little bit more crinkly. All right. And so I'm going to, just because of the different shape that I have, I am going to get a different effect. So here is my next little square. I'm going to take kind of an intentionally crumpled and ruffly little wad of this and press it down. And very often as I do that, you know, it, uh, because it is a little bit more stiff, um, the edges of it will make some interesting marks. So if I kind of come along with a place where there's some wrinkles coming down here and I tap in here. Oh, it's starting to dry. Right. So a little bit more of a hard edged effect that I can get with this without as much um, pushing. Um, so I've got my little quicker picker upper here. And it's doing a good job of, you know, giving me some little cloudy shapes. Um, <clears throat> just uh, do remember if what you are doing actually are clouds, clouds tend to be more bumpy on the top. You'll often see a different shape along the bottom, often more flat along the bottom. So you can carve that in. If you just kind of come in and dap, 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 then everything looks all puffy and rounded around all edges, looks a little bit less cloudy. But being able to lift out like that, that is, that's a really, really good skill. Another thing you can do with lifting out is to lift things out with your brush itself. And this allows you to be often very controlled. All right, so in here, oh dear, there's an area in here that is a little bit too dark. I don't want that. So I'm gonna get some paint off my brush and come in there and 
lift out some of that So I can go into an area and remove part of that. Another thing that you can do is you can take your brush and you can come in and make a little area of some little circles, little circles right in this spot. And then, oops, I took out more than I thought I would. So if I can bring some of that paint back in. Um, let's say I want to take part of this edge back. I can remove paint with my brush tip. Make that little edge in here just a little bit softer. But with your brush, you can get in and lift out paint, lift out paint, lift out paint. And so you can take parts of something and also remove color that way. Once you're dry, your ability to modify it like that goes way, way, way down. Um, but you still will have a chance. So remember at the start of it, we did this little one over here. Let's just go tap tap with this over here and see what happens. Oh, nothing, right? So, hmm, kind of underwhelming. Am I stuck with this? Well, let's see. I'm going to take another brush. This is sort of a chisel shaped brush. And I'm going to give it a slight squeeze so that the water is coming down to the tip of it. And what I'm going to do is just stroke in a line right here. Keep stroking in my line. And then I'm going to tap on top of it. So I can get, even on something, you know, here I kind of got in here and I scrubbed at it. And on a lot of light sketchbook paper, you're not going to be able to do a lot of scrubbing. Um, but on heavier watercolor paper, you can get in there and remove, you can lighten parts. And if you want to do that in a line, a chisel shaped brush is neat because as you go back and forth, you're just sort of rubbing that fine edge along it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. Right. <clears throat> Let's take a look uh, now back over here to masking fluid land. Um, oh, actually, let's check in with salt. Let's check in on what salt is up to. Isn't that interesting? So what's happening is salt is drawing liquid towards the salt crystals and we're getting this sort of interesting, very organic, sparkly, frosty texture coming out. And that's, that's the result of water being concentrated around uh, these, these sort of drawn to these, these salt crystals. And we're going to see as this dries more, um, this texture will get even more pronounced. So good to check in on that. Um, 
Now let's just do a, a little bit more. Um, here, I'm going to prepare a place for me to explore with my eraser. And I'm going to do two sides of this. All right. I'm going to let that little spot dry for a bit. And you'll see me kind of play with, uh, I'm going to play with an eraser. Um, in here with this. All right. Before I get an array, I bring out a regular eraser on this. I want to make really sure that this is nice and dry. So I'm doing this again, sort of towards the start of the the workshop here, and um, we'll let that we'll let that develop. While that's drying. Let's jump back to our friend, the masking fluid. All right. I am going to put some color down over this masking fluid. bringing in a different color and letting them blend into each other. All right, I'm gonna let that dry again. And while that's drying, let me just back up and mention a little bit more specifically about what I just did by bringing those two areas of color uh, into each other. If I have an area of color and while my paint is still wet, I come in and I'm going to take some, I now have some more paint on my brush and I have this sort of a, a darker kind of heavier concentration of that paint on my brush. Just pause for a moment and watch what starts to happen here. What you see is the paint starts to merge together. This darker paint that I have uh, that I put in here, the purple, is starting to flow out and to mix with the stuff that I already have on the page. Because I'm doing that on a page that is wet, I'm getting these, there, these sort of trails and soft blurred edges forming around the purple here. So what's happening is the paint here is moving in the wet paint. If your surface is wet, you'll get soft and blurred edges. Um, if your paper has texture to it, you'll often, often see a little bit of that texture of the paper also starting to appear in this. So this is what's meant by um, somebody doing a wet in wet. Um, if I have wet paint down and I put wet paint on top of that, I get these um, really, really interesting effects. Essentially, you can think of the purple starting to migrate ah, into that magenta. And also notice, interestingly, that as it does, it's sort of forming, forming blue as the two of those mix. This is similar to um, 
if I put down an area of color, I'm now kind of going to do sort of slightly the opposite of what I just did. All right, so here is my little area of color here. This time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, a, instead of having paint on my brush that's more dense than what was already there, I'm going to have paint on my brush that is much more watery, much more watery. So now this watery brush comes in and let's see what happens. I'm just gonna put a few little kind of spots of water onto the page here and we're going to see what starts to happen with uh with that so i've put some water on my page and you notice two things one is that there is a pale area starting to form but also notice at the edge of those pale areas very often you get a dark ring. So what's happening is that the paint in here is starting to travel out across the paper. And as it does, it's picking up little bits of the pigment in front of it and carrying those along. So imagine this little tsunami of water flowing out into the paper. And as it does, it is collecting little bits of material, any little flocks of paint that it encounters, and it is shuffling those out this direction. This is called a back run. And when it happens on your paper, if you don't expect it, it can be really, really frustrating because all of a sudden you have these, you know, I wanted just to get this a little bit more pale here, but instead I'm getting these fingers of water and they are pushing this wall of darker in front of it. So now you look, instead of a, a very clear sort of gentle transition between these things, I am getting this charge of water, bright area with a dark edge around it. If I'm not expecting to see this, um, I get really, really frustrated. Like, oh, like what on earth are you doing? Why are you doing this? But if I know that this is the way that pigment and paint usually behave, then I don't get as freaked out by it. And I can expect it. And um, when I see it, I know what's going on. And if I want to get that effect, then I can intentionally do that. That's how it looks with water. Um, and we'll try a different color of water in just a moment. Um, I, I mean, with a, a different color of paint in just a moment. I can also get very interesting effects if I put in rubbing alcohol. So here is a little container of rubbing alcohol. And what I'm gonna do is make an area of green here. So this is another kind of wet in wet here. Notice as I do put the wet in wet here, I'm putting this sort of area of kind of a heavier concentration of this in here. It's starting to kind of fan out this way, making soft edges. It's not making a background back run because I've got more dense paint that I'm putting in here. 
Let me just, uh, for the sake of demonstration, if I were to come across the top here with some water, um, I can create a back run going this way. All right, we'll see water doing its, uh, starting to do its thing over there in the corner. But what it does is very different than alcohol. Amelia, would you please fill this up with water for me? Thanks, honey. All right. I'm now going to take a little bit of rubbing alcohol and put, put it onto this page. Actually, this page is a little bit damp for me, oh, for me to do it. I maybe want to wait just a moment. We'll see. I'll put some on now and some on a little bit later. All right, what I'm going to do is here I go. I am pretty crazy, isn't it? So if I put a drop of alcohol on here. Oh, thank you. The effect is really, really different. It, it just uh, pushes the water far out of the way. And where the, the drop came down, you often see this little kind of target in there. So you can have a lot of fun. Um, you know, you drop some alcohol in on, um, on, on, on pieces that you're doing, and and you will get these these really cool effects. Just for fun, um, got my water back run here. It's still a little bit damp. I'm going to put a couple alcohol drops in there. Isn't that cool? So it's a neat special effect if you're just sort of wanting sort of random textures in the, the backs of things. Um, the uh, maybe it looks a little bit like lichen on a rock. Um, and there it is. So now let's jump down to this next row here in our special effects. I'm going to push up a little bit here. I have a toothbrush. So um, as you may know, with toothbrushes, you always want a soft toothbrush. So soft toothbrush is good for your gums, right? If you have a firm toothbrush, this is going to erode your gums. This is a firm toothbrush, which is great for watercolor bad for your gums, right? Um, so uh, what I can do with this is to, um, I'm going to just shine over to my palette right here for a moment. Um, I am going to mix up some paint here. Let me get some dark blue. Put that in here. And I'm going to pick some of that up on my toothbrush. Now I'm about to um, go and splatter it on my, my paper. Um, and I want to control where it will go. If I don't want it to go where I don't want it to go, well, then I will create a little bit of a mask. Oh, thanks, Mia. Creating a little bit of a mask around that so that areas that I don't want to get hit will be a little bit more protected. And then I can put in 
my splatter effects. Um, here's some more. And I can combine different colors. Um, let's say I wanted to get some reds in there with it. I can do this a couple of ways. One is I can um, just take some, uh, as I did before, dip it in there. But I can also just sort of take some red paint and put it onto the tip of my brush. That way I don't have to take this gunky brush, this toothbrush, and stick it into my head. And now, all right. So I've got splatter. If I've got drips that are feel too big to me, then what I do is instead of trying to wipe those up, I take a brush, I clean it off and whoops, here I go. I take a brush and I clean it off. Whoops, I'm going to oh, lift this up here. All right, take a brush, clean it off. And I can take what's now called a thirsty brush and I put the tip of it in here to soak up some of that paint. Then I give it a wipe. And I'm going to soak up some of that paint. I'm going to give it a wipe. I'm going to soak up some of that paint. Wipe, soak, wipe, soak. And this allows me to go into individual little drips that are a little bit too big. Pull those out. And that's a pretty cool special effect. <clears throat> so you can have a lot of fun with your brush. And um, people do this to put a little bit of texture into, into a page. You know, perhaps there's, there's some part of it that they want to you know, feel kind of sandy. So you can do this in the sand. Um, a little bit is going to be OK. But if you do a ton of this, then people look at it and they kind of like, oh, you splattered with a toothbrush. But a little bit of splatter um, you know, in foliage of trees, a little bit of splatter on the ground, you will kind of roughen things up enough that uh, with the sort of irregular marks, that it kind of adds some very organic liveliness to a drawing that you've made. But if you instead go really heavily with it, as I've sort of done here, then people kind of go like, oh, what's going on? Oh, you're splattering with a toothbrush. Um, so this is a cool effect, but use with caution. Have a good class, Mia. Same with the, the salt. It's a cool effect, but use with caution. Otherwise, it just looks like you're doing, you're using that effect. Another fun strategy is to take a white crayon. Um, you can also, for this, use a birthday candle. There we go. Um, the advantage of having the birthday candle in your sketching kit is that then when it's somebody's birthday, you pull out this birthday candle and for some reason you've got a birthday candle with you, a white birthday candle, and you light it and you sing happy birthday and everybody's surprised and happy and how on earth did you have a candle with you? Well, it's just part of your sketching kit or you can have a white crayon, right? Um, so if I let's say I have a wave and it is crashing. Um, I'll first kind of block in the general shape of the wave. There's a wave that is kind of curling over here, right? And in this area here, there's sort of this splashy foam uh, thing happening. Um, so what I can do is with this crayon, 
I can mark that in. And then I can paint over this. The wax in the crayon doesn't really let my paint now hit the paper. And I'll get these, especially I'm doing this on rather rough paper. I will get I'll, the texture of that will, will, will come out in a really, really cool way. So let's take a look at how this, this then looks. Um, all right, so backlit wave might be seeing kind of some green through it. And over the top of this wave here, maybe some green coming down here. Oh, but look at that, that, that bottom edge. See how that is now starting to kind of look foamy? That is because of the uh, the wax that I have in <clears throat> all right. So this kind of organic rough edge here that I'm now getting on, on this. Actually, I'm going to put a little bit of spray up here. Now, the disadvantage of this is once you put it down, it's there for good. So now I've got a happy face in my sky. And that happy face is going to be there until um, the cows come home. Um, I'm not going to be able to really get that off. Um, but still, that's, that's fun. All right, so there's a little bit of kind of my sky layer. And you get these nice, crisp little... Um, edges. I'm going to put a little bit of shadow here underneath the wave coming in. And there you go. So that's wax crayon. So having a crayon or again a birthday candle with you, really, really fun. Really fun. But again, unforgiving. Once it's there on your page, it's it's there. Um, that's not the case with the uh, masking fluid when it works. Um, well, so we'll see if we can get some of this masking. No, this is still wet. I can't get this off quite yet. All right. Oh, <laughs> the wax crayon was supposed to be down here in this box, and that was supposed to be my sponge here. So I'm going to do my sponge effect down here, my wax crayon up there. Um, all right, um, so let's let's look at let's look at the sponge, um, saran wrap, and tape. All right, so my sponge is a little piece of a natural sponge, um, and it was here on my drawing table a moment ago. <laughs> um, fortunately. I have a backup chunk of sponge. There it is. All right, so this is this is just a little piece of a natural sponge that I tore off a, another big chunk of sponge, and it is it's got this very bumpy surface. 
Jack, could you um, put that under the camera? It's our first. Oh, sorry. Thanks. So there it is, little piece of natural sponge. And your sp and every little piece that you break off, you know, you'll be thinking to yourself like this. This isn't a good piece of natural sponge. This is it's just kind of you know funky. I need I need a better one. Um, like you know, here's another just sort of shard of natural sponge, right? Uh, neither of these are looking very impressive. These were just ripped off a big chunk of natural sponge. If we were doing a class here together, I could just take a pen and, and I'd rip off a bunch of pieces and you look over at your neighbor and go like, oh, you got the good one. I, I didn't. But any one of these you're going to find really does cool, cool effects. What I do with the sponge is I'm first going to. Could you adjust your camera? We're, we're not seeing your page. Thanks. Ah, uh, thank you. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up some let's let's draw some foliage here in a tree and I'm going to generally go from lighter to darker. And so I'm going to get some light kind of yellows in here. And uh, what I'm going to do is kind of crunkle it up into a little wad. And pick up some paint with it. And then tap those down on the page. And see how they just make these very organic collections of marks. Now I'm going to get a little bit of darker green in there. Trying to kind of concentrate some of these areas of of color. And then maybe a little bit more for some darker values. I'm going to mix up now I think a little bit of reddish, just some orangish reddish stuff, I'm taking gunk from my palette here. Oh, it's sort of a brownish. That'll work. That'll work great. I'm going to pick up some of that on my sponge. Bring just a little bit of that kind of color in there. And then I let it dry. All right, I can take my sponge and set it aside. And you see how this makes this very convincing foliage. Very convincing foliage. There's no branches in it yet. That's that'll come in just a second. Um, so I can either expose it to the sun or here in my studio, I can go like this. Um, Jack, I I just muted you during the hair dryer, and now it it's not letting you unmute. Thanks. Thank you for taking care of that. Um, and you know, through some of these holes in here, you're going to be able to see these branches sticking through. And my paint is getting a little bit too thick on my tip of my brush. I want to be able to draw fine lines, and I will be able to do that um, if I don't have too much liquid in the tip of my brush. Um, but uh, so what I did is I just took my brush and I dried it off a little bit. Now I am kind of coming up here, adding some branches, letting them disappear into the the foliage. A few little branches sticking up. And 
there are a few just little shrubs. And those just they, they the the sponge makes very very um, very kind of quick happy trees, right? Um, the but if you overuse it, people will look. You'll kind of look at it like, oh, you were using splatter. Oh, you were using salt. Oh, that's a sponge. So you don't want the texture of that to overwhelm the rest of the drawing. So sometimes a good way of kind of unifying something is you can sometimes with a regular brush, you know, have an area in the background that is you know, um, sort of non, non that brush. Um, and then you can put a little bit of um, of, of this color uh, over it. So just to sort of be be aware, you don't want the the texture of that little brush thing to completely overwhelm the 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 drawing that you're doing. All you need is just one little chunk of this, and then. Before you go, just pour some water over it, squeeze it out with your fingers. It'll still be kind of dark and gunky, but you just need a little wad about this big. And um, you'll get a lot of life, a lot of mileage out of it. One thing you don't want to do with it is take it when it's gunky and dark like this and dip it into your yellow. No, 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 no. That's bad karma. Right, this little bit over here is dry. Um, I'm going to set up my saran wrap demonstration, um, and then uh, then we're going to lift, uh, come over here, and we're going to play with the uh, the eraser a little bit over here. So saran wrap is uh, kind of a strange thing. If you have just a little piece of saran wrap in your um, in your sketching kit, yeah, you can use it for saran wrap effects. Some people like the saran wrap effects. I think they're a little bit more effective on a large painting where you just want to throw some texture into some portion of the painting. Um, but I'll show you how how people use this on my sort of landscapeito style stuff. I'm finding that the saran wrap is a little bit of a less kind of uh, effective technique. Um, what you do is you take some paint and I'm going to just take some paint and put it down in this area here. And I want, I want that paint in there to be, um, I want it still to be kind of liquid and moved, moving around. So I don't want it to, to, to dry up yet. And what I'm going to do, and just sort of watch as I, as I place this saran wrap down on this surface. All right, you can see underneath that saran wrap sort of places where it's kind of bubbling up. Now, I can kind of move this into lines or blocks or patterns. You know, here. Now I'm going to let this, actually I'm going to pull, pinch this up here in the middle. Oops. Whoa. Sorry. Little saran wrap blob. Um, 
There you go. Now I'm just going to let it dry. I've put this down here and I'm going to let it dry and we'll come back a little bit later and there will be weird stuff happening. <clears throat> and we'll get to see what that is very, very soon. While that is drying, let's jump down here to this, uh, this little area here. I have an eraser here. And if I erase on my watercolor, I don't get much of an effect. Um, if I have a harder, more abrasive eraser, um, like just this one right here on the back of this pencil, what I can do is See, I've made a slight, oh, no, it doesn't really show up on the screen there. I'll do it a little bit more. I've slightly lightened this area right here. Over here, um, I've made a slight pale spot right in here. So I can, with a, an abrasive eraser, kind of get down to, um, to, to be able to, to, to slightly lighten up some areas. If I want more of a dramatic effect than that, this doesn't work in the field, but if you're doing stuff in the studio, you can bring in, this is an electric eraser. So there's a little eraser head in here and it spins around. Of course, there, there are smaller uh, battery operated electric racers. Some people carry those with them in the field. So if you're doing that, you've got a small electric eraser um, that you bring around with you in the field, what you can do is be able to um, lift out some portions of your of your painting. Hold on a second. I just realized I want to get. Um, I'm going to put into this eraser a slightly um, more abrasive head, and that's going to allow me to, hold on just a second. Or maybe I won't, because I can't find it right now. Um, if you have a erasing shield, um, then what you can also do is be able to control, oh, I blew off my Oh, I'm going to put my saran wrap back. Oops, but it's upside down. <laughs> Hold on a second. Got to turn my saran wrap around. Um, I'm going to put my saran wrap down like that. Let it continue to do its drying. Um, so with a an erasing shield, you can take little bits of uh, of of a of a watercolor painting and lighten those up. So that's similar to what we were seeing with um, the lifting out 
um, with, with dry paint. Um, here what you're doing is you're basically abrading the paper down to the point that uh, you're, you're rubbing the, the, the paint off of it. And, um, and actually at this point, it'd probably be useful to, to point out that different types of paint sit on paper in different ways. Um, some types of paint you can very easily re-wet and lift off. So this is manganese blue hue that I'm kind of playing with right here. And if you notice that this has been dry for a while and I can come in here and wiggle my brush around and go all the way down to that. Um, but with other colors, this is phthalo blue and phthalo blue likes to stain the paper. So I get in here and I rub around with the phthalo blue and I tap it and it doesn't get as, 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 as bright. That was something I probably wanted to mention earlier when I was talking about lifting out colors. But you see how much with that eraser I was able to, with, with lifting out on the stained paper, I wasn't able to, um, I was not able to uh, really get this much lighter. Um, with the abrasion from that, um, with the abrasion from the eraser, I was able to get things to back to a much brighter point. If I then try to watercolor on top of this though, this area right here where I've done my abrasion, the paper surface texture in there will probably be a little bit different and it might, I might get some funky results. So sometimes people take that eraser and they will kind of come in and add some little highlights in places in a watercolor that's towards the end of the drawing and they're not gonna be putting other layers back on top of that. I've got one final trick to show you and that is uh, using a knife to um, give me um, cool special effects on my watercolors. Um, and this is something where timing of when you are, I'm gonna to try to get brights and highlights into a painting by scraping. And, hold on a second. First, get some paint down. So where am I here? The knife. Oh, and the tape. So I have an area back here of trees and um, there are some really pale trunks up against those trees. So I've got some nice little soft edges. And I would like to get those pale trunks back into, into my drawing. For this, I am going to use um, a scraping technique. And if I scrape too early, what happens is the paint is so wet that the paint will, if I scrape something, the paint that's wet on the outsides will flow back into where I've scraped paint away. So my tool for this is just, I've got a little kitchen knife. Where's my little kitchen knife? Come back, little kitchen knife. Oh, here it is. So I've got a little kitchen knife, All right? So let me show you what happens first if I scrape too early. We'll come on over here. All right, I scrape too early. I want, say, a trunk in here. 
And if you can see what's happened in there, zoom in, where I scraped, there is now a dark line. See, what's happened is I've scraped along here and the paper is really wet. The wet paper then has sloshed into this place where I've made, kind of abraded and scratched up the surface. The surface of the paper is now taking, um, absorbing that paint even more. And I've made a dark line where I wanted a white trunk. If I'm trying to do this deliberately, I can just make, you know, a series of little lines here. And these will be kind of dark, dark trunks, right? But I want, I want light trunks on my trees. In order to do that, I have to get the timing right. And so over here, it looks a little bit wet, but maybe over here, no, nope, I put my mark down and it's starting to make a dark mark and I go like, okay, I'm just gonna have to wait. While I'm waiting for that, let me see if I can remove some of my mask over here. Oops, coming back over here and I'm just rubbing this off with my finger. Waited till it's dry. And see, I've got white paper. Underneath. Here. This masking fluid is not coming off very easily. I'm about at the point of giving up on the little pen ones. Something I have found that does help me kind of get this off is <clears throat> this bad boy. I kind of go quickly over this. close to retiring my little uh, pen style masking fluid things. Um, the ones that work in the with the jars, it's easier to get off, um, but they are a little bit more of a hassle, a little bit messier. Let's come back over here and see if this is time. Can I? Oh, here I go. Here is a pale trunk of these trees coming up here. And what I'm doing is I can scrape and I'm pushing the paint away from these parts of the the paper. You see, I'm now getting a very different effect because my paint is a little bit more dry. I haven't let it dry completely. So I'm still, I'm actually moving wet paint here. And then if I want to, I can put you know, other areas of foliage across parts of those so that there can be, you know, places where there are, you know, leaves blocking you. But that, that, that scraping out technique, that's a, that's also a fun thing to have in your quiver. A final effect that is kind of fun is that 
I'm going to take a little piece of tape, a little piece of masking tape. And tear it in a ragged way. Put that down on my paper. The type of tape that I have here is is artist's tape. It doesn't stick to the paper as much as um, sort of regular masking tape. So if I did this with regular masking tape, if I tried to take it off my paper, it would tear up the surface of my paper. But this stuff is stuff that you can take off, you can put it back down, but it will hold well enough to be able to make a little mask for you. And so here. is the effect that I get with that. Now, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I'm going to first back this up and off. I can take this off and you see that underneath here I've got sort of clumps of dark that were kind of randomly formed by this saran wrap thing. Um, but I'm also going to do is I'm going to take off all of the masking tape that I have across this page. And if you make a few before you go out into the field, if you take this kind of masking tape and you make yourself some frames on your journal page, then what you can do is come on back and after you paint those, whoops, you pull these off and you get this really cool crisp edges on your drawing. Another kind of neat effect. You'll see some people in their their sketches, there are these tight little frames around everything. Sometimes they've worked around those spaces. Sometimes they're using masking tape this artist's tape to create those spaces. There we go. There we have them. A bunch, a bunch of different effects that we can get um, with our paint. Um, and again, some of these, when overused, they will feel gimmicky. Um, but and kind of distracting. Uh, my one suggestion is that just, you know, be careful with that salt. Really, it doesn't look like snowflakes, um, but it's cool, right? It's really cool. So I'm not saying don't use salt, uh, but I'm just saying, nah, it doesn't look like snowflakes. Um, but you can have a lot of fun just, you know, playing around with different tools and sort of figuring out for like, what is the point at which you can scrape? Um, uh, do you want to carry a little bit of salt with you just for when I want a fun texture to drop in a fun texture? Um, can I add a little piece of natural sponge to my sketch kit? And where would I want to pull that out and use it? All of those are, are things that you can play with. The more you do, the more you'll get comfortable with them. 
and then you've just got a bigger bag of tricks of of how you can how you can address um, different sorts of challenges that you face with your nature journal. I hope that this was a useful little tutorial and that you can incorporate some of these strategies into what you're doing with your own nature journal.